Hi, I just wanted to thank you for watching and listening to my videos and my podcasts for over 11 years. When I started this project, I really just wanted to give back what I had learned. You know, that really is what I thought my legacy would be, and I still think it is. Even though when I look back at all these old videos, I seem to have a lot more hair and a lot less wrinkles. So it's a, it's a win-lose situation sometimes, if you know what I mean. But the idea was to educate people on the native arts, art, artists, collecting, things that I have learned over that period of time, and to have my legacy be that I leave everything that I've learned to you, to the audience out there. So there will be a way of saying, at least in this time frame, this is what the current thoughts were on art and Native American art and the artists. And since that time, my videos have had over 2 million views. We've got 10,000 subscribers. I've done 165 long podcasts from one to two hours with 75,000 downloads. And the podcasts are on the Art Dealer Diaries, which I do on YouTube as well. So it's a record of all those artists art dealers, collectors, individuals that I find interesting to also leave a legacy for their lives as well. So I want to thank you so much for watching all my videos and listening and all the wonderful feedback that I've gotten over the years. And hopefully over the next 10 years, I won't lose all my hair. So thank you. And now for a compilation of 11 years of my best videos. I hope you enjoy. One of the biggest problems with dealing in early American paintings is that you have fakes and frauds. One of the reasons you come to a person like me is my expertise and my specialty. I'm going to tell you, yes, this is right or no, it isn't. So whatever you do, if you're going to look at baskets and you have the ability to touch them, like in our gallery, don't ever grab them from the rim because you may have a handful of rim and you may own an Oya. You have to look on the back. Okay, so you look at the back and you see these old tags. You have a Kennedy Gallery. You can see that it's an old board, but the frame itself is not old. Classic blankets are very collectible. They're hard to find, and when you do, you're probably going to pay a lot, unless it happens to be like the Antiques Roadshow, where it's sitting on the back of your couch. If you go into the gallery and they immediately give you a hard sell, there's generally a problem. When we, we are in the business to sell artwork. But more importantly, at least in my gallery, we want to educate, we want to make long-term commitments to our clients, and we're really not interested in just making a single sale. We want to have a relationship. This is a great example, as well as this, of Daisy Tlagelchi's work. She was one of the great weavers, and she won for 20 years in a row the best of show at the Gallup International Indian Fair. This, in fact, took first place in, like, I think, 1954. So one of the things that I've seen for some artists is they raise their prices too fast. Now, this can be the kiss of death because they're selling, 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 and then they double their prices because they're selling everything, and now, all of a sudden, their market's dead in the water, and everyone says, well, I'm not going to buy it. It was X, and now it's 2X, and it's just been, you know, one month ago. A very confident artist will leave just a single brush stroke each time. When they put their brush on that palette, mix the color and put it on the canvas, they know where it's going. And I can tell that they knew where it was going. It's very distinctive where it's going. And then this can be impressionist, it can be tight. But if you look at the actual close up at the brush strokes, this is going to tell you a great deal about the confidence of that artist. This is a painting that I bought at an art auction. And on this occasion, there was at least a thousand people at this auction. It was mainly staff, museum, directors, there was even a major auction house was at this place. And they had this listed in the silent auction as a copy, as a reproduction. And it was basically nothing to buy. Now, I recognized immediately this was not the case. And how did I do that? From the back. Kachina dolls were made for the girls to experience the dances. The men did the dances and the girls needed to be part of it. So generally it was the uncles who would make the dolls, which is what we call them today as dolls or Kachina dolls, and they would give them to their nieces and so they could follow along and learn about the dances. One of the very best uh, artisans was a guy named Fred Kabodi, and Fred Kabodi with Paul Sofke started a school at the Hopi High School where they taught servicemen how to make jewelry. And it was at this time they started to make a very unique type of jewelry, which is a silver overlay. And this is really kind of what we think about today when we think about Hopi jewelry. So when you look at the bracelets and pins like this, how can you tell what's the difference? Okay, this is how 
I do it. One, when you look at a Zuni bracelet, generally they are, in my opinion, a little finer stones. The bezel work is done better. Uh, and when I say better, I mean it's just more intricate. I, it really holds the stone beautifully. And if you look closely at these, you can see the fine bezel work. And you'll see things like petty point often, which are very fine uh, types of stones. What is the condition of the object? Does it have restoration? Does it have problems? Most online auctions, amazingly enough, do not have that out front. They may have just a little blurb. If they have just a little blurb that says something about usual condition for age and um, you know condition, something like that that's very nebulous, you need to dig deeper because this is kind of a way for them to just not have to deal with does it really have a problem? Sometimes there's auctions that know there's a problem with it and they just say, you know, this is the usual condition for age. Well, that's not good enough. This is used for drilling holes. It's a pump drill. And they would spin it around and use it as the mechanism to drill different pieces of turquoise. Uh, and when you look at this, you can see it's gray dated at the bottom on the tip. And what that tells you is if you look at early beads and there is a very cone shape like appearance, you know that's a pump drilled uh, turquoise bead. And that means something, that means it's early. And it's probably somewhere between the 20s or even before that, could even be from the 1890s, 1880s. Tufa casting, which I'm gonna to talk to you about in a, in a video all by itself. But basically, tufa cast looks like this. It's out of volcanic ash. Uh, it's a stone which is carved and they put the silver inside and it makes this design element and it comes up with a element like this. Late classic is these 1860s to 70s period. They're still using really early yarns, natural yarns, but some aniline may have started to creep into the, to the usage. These blankets, if they're a late classic third phase chief's blanket, can be 15,000 to say 75,000. I can tell you though, if you're gonna do a podcast, get good material as far as you know the cameras, the mics, soundproof room if possible. You can do it in, in person or you can do it Zoom. I've done, the first two thirds of mine were all in person, which I thought was fantastic. I said I'd never do it you know, remotely, I just you know, can't see it. Pandemic came, did it remotely Zoom. I like it just as well, maybe better. When we really think of the golden age of the pictorial weavings, those are somewhere in the 1890s to 1940s time frame. And they're still being made, and there's all sorts of interesting types that you can see. Now, structurally, what I wanna look at when I look at a pot, any kind of pot, in this case, this Akuma, is I wanna see, is it straight? And this, it's got a little tilt, very little, but there's something there, so I wanna take that into consideration. I wanna look for cracks, and if there's any uh, problems with the integrity of the piece, a simple gross method is to just hit the pot. It has a nice ring to it, so that means there probably isn't any major cracks. 